At age 15, Frank fell in love with the fascinating world of food. Eager and intrigued, he began apprenticing directly under some of the top chefs in the country. He became a classically trained chef at the New England Culinary Institute and a graduate of the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, a program that would change the course of Frank's cooking and lifestyle. While his culinary offerings are based in classic technique and traditional foods preparation, he has also been immersed in using food as medicine. Wearing his chef's hat, he focuses on sustainable cuisine, seeking the highest quality foods grown locally and harvested in season, supporting the crucial farm to table method of preparing food. His adventurous culinary offerings have been showcased throughout the health community as Frank is the featured chef for New York Times best-selling Dr. Alejandro Junger's Clean Eats book, cookbook. He's catered weddings, special events, and weekend workshops across the country and regularly feeds guests at Daniel Vitalis and Arthur Haynes' Primitive Skills courses. Frank and his family live off the grid in mid-coast Maine. They run Three Lily Farm, a center offering online workshops, catering, and unique products created to educate and immerse their clients in a sustainable and healthy lifestyle. Please help me in welcoming Frank Giglio. So today we're going to talk for the next hour about traditional foods, what that means to me, and how you could implement the past into your modern day lifestyle and diet. We'll do a little food demo towards the end. And uh, if there's any extra time before lunch, we'll do some Q&A. Sound good? All right. So we drove here all the way from Maine, where my family lives. And uh, we live off grid in a solar powered home uh, on 26 acres. And we have fruit trees and kind of that really awesome um, sort of back to the land home style that I try to live and implement in my teachings as well as my catering. So the way I eat is the way I feed all my clients, whether they know it or not. Um, and I think that just helps um, sort of give them a, a different approach to the way they eat as well. So I sort of, there's sort of that thing when you can't get kids to eat healthy. You got to just like sneak it in there. So I don't try to sell my clients on the way that I prepare the food, but I just sneak it in there. So that's just a little bit about that. All right. So we're going to start with this, which um, I found this quote last year, and it really resonated with me. And it says, it is important to never break the chain of traditions because once it is one generation removed, it becomes very difficult to bring it back. And that was um, from a chef, Magnus Nilsson, who owns a restaurant in Sweden called Favakin. Um, they do, when they talk about farm to table, this is like as full on as it gets. I think the restaurant only seats maybe eight to 10 people. Um, it's so far north in Sweden, there's hardly anything there, but they're using pretty much everything they could find within that local ecosystem. And, um, and it's really neat. And this um, was just so powerful for me. Last year, or I think, yeah, last year, I had my family up to visit. I grew up in southern Connecticut. And I have uh, seven uh, nieces and nephews. Um, and it was for the first time ever I, s I made macaroni, which I grew up on in an Italian-American home. Uh, we made lasagna from scratch with my mom and my 21-year-old niece and my 7-year-old nephew. And we were all together, sort of the tomato sauce was on the stove. We made the homemade mozzadella, as we'd call it, um, and then made the lasagna sheets from scratch using fresh main uh, grain flour. And um, we put this all together. And this was like a tradition that my mom talks about. I have one photo of my great-grandmother. Um, she would, they called her Fat Nani, and she would sit at the, um, at the bed with a big piece of plywood, and she would use her fingernail to cut um, the cavadels. And um, my mom has never made fresh pasta. My dad never made fresh pasta. None of my nieces or nephew have either. And um, this was something that, for the first time in most of these kids' life, um, it was something we could sort of relive the traditions of my Italian-American heritage and uh, sort of hopefully 
some of them will be intrigued to do this later on. So when I'm talking about um, traditions, it's not only our, our heritage and culture of how we grew up, which I think is so important, but the traditions of the indigenous people around the world. And for me, being in Maine and being a New Englander most of my life, I'm really interested in eating a diet um, based on the foods that grow around my home. And um, there's a big part for me about um, time and place. And I feel blessed that we can come here and drive a mile down the road and go to Whole Foods and get some foods. Um, it's super handy and it's great. But for me, it's all about time and place. So when you start tapping into eating locally and seasonally, um, you really um, tap into this idea of time and place. And so when you're eating, when I'm collecting egg corns, which most people think it's for the squirrels, um, that is such an important food um, and was such an important food for many cultures around the world. It was eaten on um, almost every continent besides Antarctica. Um, at one time, 50% of the California natives' diet was acorns, and it's all become mostly a, a forgotten food, but it's also one of the most um, nutrient-dense, especially nuts, that you could eat. And we're eating one that's really high in, in good fats, and so that's something I incorporate into my diet. Um, and so this is really, really important for me. All right, so this is a little picture of my, what I call my fermentation station. And um, this used to have the fridge and then some counter space. And I put the fridge in the basement and I created this space uh, so that I could have all my sort of tools and basically fermented foods and also different stuff, um, all with the exception of these olives at the bottom. Um, all this stuff was either foraged, grown at my home, or grown by local farmers. Um, and for me, this is a way to sort of preserve uh, the foods that are in season uh, and so that I could enjoy the taste of summer um, all year long. So um, in a pinch, I might buy some fermented foods at the store, but when I can, I like to um, preserve these and do it myself. And so um, not everybody can create this sort of setup in their house, but uh, maybe a little bit smaller. But uh, this is super fun. I love looking at the wall. The wall is actually sort of a violet color. I have my, this is my uh, acorn cracker, so it makes cracking acorns a little bit easier. And um, all sorts of different stuff, S infused vinegars, homemade miso, homemade honey wine, and uh, I'm a big hot sauce fanatic, and so usually there's just a lot of uh, peppers there. Um, but this is something that uh, has been such an interest to me of capturing the foods that I eat, or capturing the seasons and moving them forward to the time when they're not available. So um, you can't keep fresh tomatoes all year round. And most people know in January and February the tomatoes aren't that good. So if I can make a homemade salsa that could then go into my cellar and just stay in a cool space or be in my fridge, that allows me to enjoy that um, tomato at its maximum freshness and um, increase nutrition later on in the day. All right. So this is a, a, a Native American, and he's drying uh, fish that he was caught. And it took me a while. This is just some ins inspirational uh, photos that I found. And it sort of just sparks this interest of uh, eating, eating a more um, locally based diet. So at certain times of the year, these folks would be harvesting lots and lots of fish. Obviously, they didn't have refrigeration, so they need to figure out a way to preserve them. And so they were um, drying them with the use of uh, smoke over an open fire. This guy, this is the modern day uh, amazing chef, Francis Malman, who's in uh, the Patagonia region. And he's uh, cooking lamb over a fire with a bunch of different veggies and such. And he was a, a big high-end chef in New York City, won this big award, and then uh, gave it all up and decided he's going to go back to, uh, to uh, working with fire. And so he wrote this great book about cooking with fire and I think the seven elements of fire. And uh, all he does, he uses fire as sort of an ingredient. 
So getting those uh, flavors, those bitter flavors and qualities from different foods or from the fire uh, to implement that and using that as sort of an ingredient. We have one more. Here's another native here with some more fish that she's curing or smoking near the fire. Just super fun. I think she's got some Converse All-Star, so a um, little bit more modern, but... All right, so we're going to start here. This is a picture that was taken uh, by Weston A. Price, uh, which is a very important uh, man in my life. Um, he was a dentist who traveled around looking at wild people's diets and noticed that when they ate their native diet that was based around the foods available to them in their uh, local ecosystem, that they had really great health, really great dental all their teeth came in. They didn't have to worry about getting their molars pulled out. Wide jaws. Um, very robust people who were free from a lot of the modern day diseases that we, some of us, have encountered and millions of people are encountering today. And he noticed, uh, there's no more slides about the negative photos that he saw, but he saw that cultures that were introduced to, say, a lot of the uh, Americanized foods started having those dental con issues and um, a lot of other health concerns came up. And when you see um, a lot of the Native Americans here in the US now, they're dealing with diabetes and all sorts of problems. Before I found out about this guy, I was a classically trained chef. I was working in restaurants. I went to culinary school in uh, 1997. And for the first eight years that I was cooking, I wanted to be sort of like your, your Emerald Lagasse. Um, the Food Network was just getting big, and I wanted to be just a real famous restaurant chef. And so I was fully immersed into um, the restaurant lifestyle. Anybody ever here work in restaurants? Sort of a, a dark place. And, um, and so in 2003, I, was, um, I just needed some major changes. And so I actually got a job offer at a local health food store, running a tiny little deli kitchen doing your kind of classic vegetarian fare. And um, I ran this business for four years and uh, doing juices and smoothies and all by myself and basically taught myself vegetarian food. And then I would go onto the bookshelves and I'd sort of experiment with macrobiotic cooking and Ayurvedic cooking and um, raw food kind of thing and uh, really just exploring this whole new world to me because in the restaurants it was like, Salt and fat, that was, and you just add that and everything is going to taste good. You always hear like, the more butter the better, which I kind of believe now, but, um, you know, it's tons of salt, tons of dairy, tons of fat, fried everything in canola oil, which isn't that great that we learned earlier. And um, around 2006, I reached my sort of um, crisis, health crisis. I was well over... Um, 200 pounds. I was living just a really, even though I was working at this health food store, I was really just so imbalanced and um, sort of needed a way out, so to speak. And I went to the Anaheim West Food Show. Anyone ever been there? Expo West. They have one here too, I think in Baltimore, the Expo East. And I saw David Wolf. Everyone know him? So I saw David Wolf doing a demo on juicing. And he was being his normal zany self throwing orange peels at people, and, and um, he finished the talk. And I know, one thing I noticed is all the folks that were sort of in his entourage looked really vibrant. And uh, I was like, man, there's something about this guy. And he said, well, come join me at my booth. I'm giving away my book, and I'll sign it and whatever. And so I went to the booth. I got the book, and uh, it was the Sun Food Diet Success System. And uh, I sat in the corner of that expo and just started reading. And by the time I got back home, I stopped eating meat, stopped eating dairy, quit smoking cigarettes, quit alcohol, and uh, fully immersed myself into this idea of eating raw food. And uh, for the next four years, well, we'll start with the first six months of that, I lost over 50 pounds. I started running and ran my first marathon within six months. Um, just saw one thing after another sort of going in favor of my health, and, uh, and kept, that, kept up with that for about four years. And I reached a point where 
I was no longer really feeling those health benefits. The first six months, the first year, the first year and a half were amazing. And then I just kept sort of going, dipping down lower and lower. But I was like, if I could just tweak this a little bit more, I'm going to get to the point where it's like everything is great. And I started running, and it wasn't just like the normal jaunt. It was like I got to a point where I started training for a 100-mile race in Vermont. And so here I was eating mostly only fruit and running 50 to 90 miles a week. And uh, eventually completed the race. I did 100 miles in under 24 hours and did it solely on fruit and coconut water, which I was very proud of. But I was about 140 pounds. It was the leanest I'd ever been in my adult life. And um, although I could run anywhere at any time and not really think about it, I had no strength. My digestion was really poor. I was seeing major dental um, issues with myself and uh, realized that something had to change. And so the first thing was to just actually eating some cooked food and um, found this guy, the Weston A. Price Foundation, which was started by Sally Fallon. And I got the book Nourishing Traditions and sort of rekindled this whole um, sort of last uh, 10 years or so of my cooking that I sort of pushed aside for this sort of uncooking way or uncooking lifestyle that I was living. And so um, I was making chicken stock again, which we're going to talk about in a little while, and um, just getting back to eating whole foods and call real food and uh, saw my health come back. And uh, eventually I, I went to a, a dentist, and I think I had 13 cavities filled, which I could probably, um, you know, eating 30 to 40 bananas almost every day, probably had a little bit of an issue around that, helped me with that, but um, it really helped me get back in touch with um, eating a local food diet. My wife and I got together, lived in New Hampshire, and we did this uh, local food challenge to ourselves in March, which if you live in New, northern New Hampshire, March is pretty cold, there's not that much growing, and it started off as like, oh, we can get some meat from this guy, and we knew this local dairy farmer, and then we're like, man, it's like we got to find something else here. And so we, it started branching out to like the whole state of New Hampshire. And it's like, well, Maine's pretty close. We could eat some foods from Maine. And then it went to um, New England. And then eventually the 30 days were over. But it was like, wow, we could really, if we, if we start looking around, we could find a lot of good food that's raised and grown around here. We eventually moved to Maine, um, lived in southern Maine for a couple years, moved up north, and then... That's where we are today, but um, it was a really powerful experience to go to being really low with your health, to finding something that you think is going to cure everything, and it at least did for me for a short time, but then brought me back down. And so it's been all this idea of like finding where the balance is. And so this is my home today, and this was just taken a couple weeks ago um, with the leaves starting to change. But... Um, on this 26 acres, we're lucky that the guy who built this home um, used to be a tree grower. And so we're reaping the benefits of what he did 20 years ago. And I'm sad that his um, marriage didn't last, but I'm very grateful that I get to live in this house now because we have American chestnut trees and mulberry trees and elderberries and um, raspberries and blueberries. And it's like once the spring comes, it's like every couple of weeks, something else comes into season. And it's like my kid will just run outside and you yell his name. He's like, I'm at the grapes or I'm at the blueberries. And so we've been able to develop this idea of eating and implementing time and place right here in our own little nook of, of Maine. And so for us, I like this idea of eating an uh, ancestral life way. And so I'm going to talk to about the culinary side of that. Obviously, there's so much that impacts our health and uh, community and exercise and getting out in nature. But that's a big thing for me is so much of what I do involves being in nature and the natural movement that comes with being in our ecosystem. I think we've really become um, sort of divorced from nature. And some people um, see it as like a taboo to be out in nature. And so... Um, 
you know, my, I always joke at my dad because he, he would never even think about being barefoot outside. And it's just something that, like, that's just gross. Your feet are going to get dirty. You might step on a bug, like, whatever it is. But for me, whenever I'm having a bad day, if I just go walk in the woods, it's all cleared. I jump, that pond is, is really low, but it's a spring-fed pond. We've sort of had a drought this year, but I've cut holes in that in February and jumped in it. And no matter what's happening, when you jump in that pond, it all goes away. There's nothing else to think about except, damn, get me out of here. But um, it really is like the most amazing feeling when you actually finally get warm again. But So one of the big things for me, and we're talking about eating a good quality diet, I think a big part of that is, is choosing sort of the groundwork of that, and that's starting with good quality water. And um, we have great water right outside here that they're giving away or for sale. But um, for me, it's like eating an all-organic diet, but then spraying or putting chemical-made um, lotions on your body. So your body actually absorbs more toxins through your skin than you do with what you eat. So if you're eating really well, but you're putting all these toxins into your body, or you're taking showers in chlorinated water or water with fluoride in it, you're sort of it might offset the great food that you're eating. So for me, this has become um, one of my, almost one of my passions is actually sort of going and finding different springs. So, um, and when I first um, found these couple springs in uh, New Hampshire when we were living up there, there's one at the base of Mount Washington, which is one of the, the best water I've ever drank. But I, it brought me back to when I was a te uh, young boy, and I used to ride my bike across town. And I remember we would like buy our Gatorade, and then um, I would pedal all around town. And then we had this um, little tiny spring that, was, unfortunately, it was right next to a golf course. And I didn't know that at the time, so hopefully it wasn't contaminated. But we would drink our Gatorade and then fill up our bottles at the spring. And so every time we rode our bikes across town, we would go and, and drink from that spring. And that was something totally forgot about until I uh, started getting into this again. But there's a great website called findaspring.com. And pretty much, it's a, a worldwide database for fresh springs. And so we have one six miles from our home, which unfortunately, that one dried up this year from the drought. Um, but this one is about 50 minutes from our, our house. And this water is so amazing. And so. Um, and we also have a, a deep well that was dug, and so that water is great, and at certain times of the year, I like drinking that as well. But there's something quite special about drinking spring water, and we have our car bore, and we packed it in the back of the truck and, and brought our water with us um, for the weekend. But really, if we're going to start eating well, I think we've got to make sure we're using good quality water. So that's a, a good start for me. Next, this is one of the, the, my fun things that I like to do and when I work with different clients or I'm one of those guys if I'm at your home and I'm going to be spending some time there I obviously ask permission but I like to go through people's kitchens and I'll usually organize them free of charge um, but if I'm going to do a lot of cooking at your house I need to be able to just make myself at home in your kitchen and I might throw some stuff away um, but if we're going to start eating well and we have our water dialed in I think we need to set up our kitchen and let our kitchen be um, well. And so I call, started calling it the kitchen sweep. And I'll do this every couple, um, even in my own home. This is my one little pantry where most of my dry goods are kept. And it looks really nice now because I was going to take a photo. But within a couple weeks, because there's so, I do a lot of cooking. And so within a couple weeks, this just looks like a crazy mess. And you know, the paper bags from the health food store, from the bulk bin or any of that kind of stuff, they just get piled up. And, and when you start buying the same thing because you can't find it, um, this kitchen is great because there's no, there's no cabinet doors. And I remember our last house, it was loaded with cabinet doors. And I, I like eating dulse, the seaweed. And I kept having to buy more packages of dulse. And one day, I went into the cupboard to clean it, and I had like five bags of dulse. And they just kept getting packed into the back. And then you're like, damn, I don't have any of this. And I got to go buy more. And so one night, Camille was sleeping. And uh, I, took, I unscrewed all the cabinet doors. And from then on, 
it's like I love the open space concept. And, you know, for that, it's also, it's pretty inspiring because you, sometimes you get into like a little food rut or you're eating the same things. If you could see everything that's in there, you'd be like, ooh, I got, I got red lentils. Let's do something with that. Or, oh, I got this, this dulse that I could see now. Let's eat that. And so what it does is I take everything out of the cupboards, and I start with one at a time. So everything that's in there comes out, goes onto my, uh, my counters, and then you start sorting through everything. See, looking at the packages, and if, if this is something you're new to, you're on this new health journey, this is where you could start reading the labels and under, getting a better understanding of what's in your food. So um, when you start seeing uh, these ingredients that maybe you can't under, know, don't know how to pronounce or don't know what they are, that could be something that gets set aside or composted or whatever. My wife grew up in sort of a, a homeschooling community. They were, her mom did everything from scratch. And if they wanted treats, she had three, two brothers and her. If they wanted treats at the store, they had to read the labels to their mom. And if they couldn't pronounce it, or it was this crazy word that they couldn't tell how it was derived, they weren't allowed to eat it. And so sorting through everything, let's see. Um, uh, just helps you sort of consolidate everything. Next, we want to condense everything. So you get to the point where you have like a half gallon jar and there's only a little tiny bit of food left in there. So we sort of condense everything. And then I like to keep things labeled. So if people come over and help out in the kitchen, they can actually see everything. And so that's a big thing of, um, especially if you have kids that are part of your, um, part of your family, they could start to understand what some of these foods are. So they're getting a lesson in understanding what everything is. And then you put everything back and you do it nice and organized. So I'll keep the grains in one place and the beans and the oils and so on and so forth. Down below, I have my homemade, my homemade vinegars that I like to make. We'll go from there. Next, we need to invest in your knives, your cutting boards, and your equipment. And so this is, an, this is one of my absolute favorite tools in the world. Who has a KitchenAid? I mean, sorry, a Vitamix. OK, a lot of you. This is, I love this thing. But it's a, definitely an investment. And maybe you don't all have the, the finances to invest. So this is like a super awesome piece of equipment. And I actually use this more now um, than I do this for certain projects. But, um, First and foremost, I think having a good knife that fits your hand and stays sharp is key. And second is a good quality cutting board. And I'm going to promote a company called Booz Blocks. I think it's B-O-O-S Blocks, because I think they're the best. And they're thick. They don't move around. They're wooden. And uh, they're just awesome. This, I just bought this knife. This was, um, I paid way more than I probably normally would for a knife, but this is like my go-to, and it's what I use for 95% of all my cooking. And I just love this thing. And so good equipment allows you to do things a little bit more efficiently. If you're working with a dull knife, it's, you're, it's easier to get hurt, and you're going to cut slower, and you're, it's going to be harder to do everything. So um, you want to use equipment that's going to help you make things go faster. Um, you know. I love cooking from scratch, and I do that often, and I sometimes have to do, um, I make a lot more work for myself, but it doesn't mean I want to spend four hours in the kitchen every day. So we learn to um, do things in a way that will help make all that stuff efficient. And so having something like a crock pot or a slow cooker, I had chicken stock in here that I started last night, and so if anybody was on the eighth floor, they might have smelled uh, nice chicken <laughs> soup cooking. Um, but this is something, if you're someone who has to take the kids to work, or take the kids to school in the morning and then go to work, and you're going to be gone all day, and you're tired when you get home, and the last thing you want to do is spend an hour in the kitchen, you could throw some stuff in here, set it on high, and when you come home, all you have to do is add a little bit of seasoning, and you're good to go. So um, there are ways to sort of cut corners, but um, this idea of like biohacking, where it's like everything has to be sort of shorter and quicker and faster, it's like, Good food takes time, but you don't have to give them all your time. But you have to put in the time to make it shorter at some time. So um, picking one or two days um, to do a little bit extra food prep, to get, 
to get you through the week is a big thing. So for me, I work from home, so, but I do a lot of catering, so I need to leave food for my family when I am gone from the kitchen. So there might be one day a week where um, I'll make chicken stock, I'll cook a little bit extra food or make some wild rice, and, and not just a cup, it'll be like eight cups. Or, so you have plenty to go around for several days. So there we go. This is a big one for me, and I love, and my friend Daniel Vitalis, who was a speaker here a couple years ago, he talks about eating from the four kingdoms. And, you know, the big thing about food is everybody has their own individual preferences, and some people might be more on a healing diet, some people might be more on a balance, or just in trying to balance out their diet. Um, but I think this idea of eating from the four kingdoms is key for all of us because we're all from the same species who've been eating um, animal foods and from these four kingdoms for a really, really long time. And so I think it's key that we need to figure out how much of everything works for our bodies. But I do feel we could all use food from all four kingdoms. And so we're going to break this down a little bit. And the first one is going to be animal foods. And these were sheep that I raised at my house um, several years ago. Those sheep eventually, one, they helped because they were my little free um, lawn mowers, and so they kept the grass down, and they were fed no grain, and they eventually became food for myself and my family. And um, we need, for me, I really feel we need uh, the mammals as well as fish. And I was lucky to just go on a uh, fishing charter and have about 15 pounds of fillets that went into the freezer. And this wild-caught fish and good quality, pasture-raised, organically fed animals um, are a really important part of our diet. And so I really feel this is something that we all need, maybe in different amounts to suit your body, but a real important part. Next is obviously we need food from the plant kingdom. And here's a real nice uh, haul from my local farmer's market. I think this went to a catering job. So they're getting foods that were probably all harvested a day or two um, before I cooked them. And so we need plants. And I feel a lot of um, people sometimes underestimate that. Um, and it's a big part. And not just our vegetables, which I think are crucial, but also all the herbs, and uh, different components of the plant kingdom. Putting herbs into my body through teas and tinctures um, and using plants as medicine have become such a valuable part of my diet. And I keep in my truck um, three or four different tinctures. And so when I'm driving, I just hit in the tinctures. And uh, it's an easy way for me to sort of get in my uh, little plant medicine. And, and it's an also a way for me to implement the foods that are growing around my home into my diet, that it wouldn't be something I would eat in a salad. Uh, last year, I, I learned a plant um, a botanist named Arthur Haynes did a workshop at my home, and he introduced me to this one plant called Self Heal, uh, which is native to Maine. And uh, it sort of works as a, an overall adaptogen. And uh, there was one patch about this big right out next to my the kids' swing set. And this year, and I'd never, I probably had seen it before, but I never knew what it was. And he showed us that one patch, didn't see it anywhere else on the property. And this year, it literally just like filled my yard. I mean, it was like all over the place. And so as I learned more about it, I then learned that I could use it as tea, and I could also make an alcohol tincture so I could um, take in different qu uh, nutritional qualities from that. And so that's become an important part of my everyday sort of diet is you ever hear of like the top five herbs you need are growing right outside your, your yard. And so um, I've noticed that in the four years that we've lived here, how important um, seeing all these plants are growing right outside my back door. Oop, I just skipped one. There you go. Next is bacteria. And so... Um, I am an absolute huge fanatic of fermented foods, and obviously with that you get a wide range of health benefits. And for me, when I had changed um, at the sort of the end of my raw food, or raw food days, 
when I started to implement some cooked foods into my diet, one of the biggest things I saw is I couldn't digest anything. A bowl of, a bowl of uh, quinoa, it was just, it just, I couldn't move it. Um, and so I learned about the body ecology diet, and I got the, the book Wild Fermentation, and for a year just went crazy on fermented foods and, and healing my gut. Um, and there's so much research now that links gut health to brain health and autism, and so much stuff is happening with fermented foods, and there's sort of this revival. I think there's two or three fermented food booths that are here this weekend, so go check them out. But uh, implementing that is uh, super important. And um, again, it not only preserves the ingredients into the latter part of the year, but uh, you get all that nutrition in it. It builds flavor. So you take sort of a bland piece of cabbage and you um, get more flavor out of it. Um, I could use this in all sorts of different ways. I could add this to different recipes if I just want sort of the acidic nature of the the um, foods, but uh, um, really important. And we're going to do this demo in just a bit, and you'll see how I implement fermented foods into the soup. Next is fungi. And we have some oyster mushrooms that are growing on an old stump in my yard. And with mushrooms, there's the culinary side of mushrooms where you can get your black trumpets and chanterelles, and they're awesome, but also using mushrooms as medicine. And so for me, I like to forage these edibles, but I could also, this was harvested about two weeks ago. Who knows what this is? Yell it. Chaga. So this has become sort of the, the big um, mushroom in the health world. This is chaga mushroom. This grows on birch trees, mostly in northern climates. Um, one of the highest sources of antioxidants. Um, that and chocolate sort of go back and forth and uh, great for the immune system, really powerful food. Another one we have here is reishi, and so this is also great for the immune system, and so I harvest this, and I dry it, and I put it into my soups, and I put it into uh, alcohol and make a tincture for that, and so I work on my immune system by taking these alcohol tinctures. Next is choose wild foods first or whenever you can, and so for me, Wild foods is a way to get me outside. It allows me to learn about new things. So I'm constantly learning about new plants that I could forage. Um, wild, wild caught fish. Um, choosing wild caught fish over farmed fish is a big one for me. If you know uh, people who hunt and you can get um, wild animal, uh, deer or elk or moose or whatever, great. Um, and you may, not have, you may live in a city and not have the ability to forage, but I tell you, I was just in New Haven, Connecticut, and there was ginkgo trees, which have um, great properties that you could eat, and you could forage in a lot of cities. I used to collect olives and citrus fruits when I lived in um, uh, Arizona that were just growing sort of all over the place. And uh, you, know, you can go to most health food stores and choose wild blueberries, which are um, superior in nutrition compared to the domestic cultivars. And so um, Brazil nuts is a wild food. And so there's ways that you could implement wild foods without having to throw your backpack on and, and go out into the woods every day. But really, um, one of the most powerful things for me was getting out and starting to forage and finding my food. Uh, obviously, it saves money, but it connects you more closely to what's growing around you. And to the right, I have a, uh, a wild rose petal and rhubarb mead that I made. I went on a 100-mile canoe trip uh, last summer, and we foraged that rhubarb and this uh, spruce tips um, on the river, and then I went home and, and made a homemade honey wine with that. Two, we've been talking about this, is learning these traditional techniques. So for me, I eat grains. I'm not gluten-free. I know it doesn't work for everybody, but I make sure I do certain things to maximize the, the properties of those grains when I eat it. And of course, I do buy flour, but whenever I can, I, I um, try to soak the grains first. Or when I'm working with beans and different legumes, I soak those uh, grains, um, which were all traditional practices and sort of forgotten about now. And um, what that does is reduce the, the phytic acid, which is those anti-nutrients, which I learned a lot about through the Weston A. Price Foundation. 
and um, it helps open up sort of that nutrition so we can actually absorb it a little bit easier. And um, takes a little bit of extra time. Anyone ever make their own nut milk? So you got to take your almonds and you got to soak them overnight. The first couple times it was probably a little pain in the butt to actually do that. But then once you, um, once you get into a rhythm, it just becomes second nature. So while I might want to watch a show on the computer, I'm doing these sort of things and I put, set the computer in my kitchen. So it's just about making these little bits of priorities and just getting into a natural rhythm where it's sort of nice and easy for you. Next, a big one for me is upgrading your fats. And so we have some rendered lard, we have some homemade ghee, and we have some cultured butter. And so eliminating those, a lot of those plant-based fats that are high in the omega-6 and getting more into the high omega-3 fats and also getting those through eating small fish were key for me. And this might freak you out, but utilizing all the parts. We've sort of, we like our ribeye steaks and we like our nice fish fillets, but a lot of that nutrition comes from the parts that people don't eat. And um, my mom used to talk about eating liver all the time until she was pregnant with me and then stopped. But so much nutrition, if you want to make good quality chicken stock, you got to find chicken legs, chicken feet, because they make the most, the best stock. And this here is a flounder roe. We're trying to get all that nutrition. You could see in indigenous culture, especially up in the northern regions where they're consuming fish. Um, that was a big part for um, our pregnancy protocol of eating good quality um, eggs. And then below, more of a snack, but definitely a lot of good, uh, good nutrition there is eating uh, chicken skin. So avoiding all the uh, lean meats and getting that skin because it is part of the, part of the animal and um, you get a lot of good nutrition in there. So I like to incorporate all those parts. And if you're on a budget, liver is way more nutritious and way cheaper than buying ribeye steak. So um, you can get a lot more sort of bang for your buck by choosing these uh, parts. So hearts, all that stuff. I don't do kidneys, so we'll forget about that one. But. And then getting your family involved. This is my son, Wilder. He's my number one foodie. But he loves taking part in everything I do, whether we're foraging for elderflowers. Um, I don't, we were making some sort of pie crust there and just eating. And so getting him involved early, um, there's probably, he doesn't like, well, he'll tell you, he doesn't like beets and he doesn't like spicy food, but there really is no food he won't eat. And I think that starts, I think it starts when Camille was pregnant with him and eating a, a diverse diet. But we've introduced all sorts of different foods right from the start, um, never really made uh, different meals for him, um, and just try to get him involved in all the processes while you can. And two, most of all, before this demo, is keeping it fun and having a good time. If you're grinding away in the kitchen and just hating what you're doing and forcing down these foods because maybe liver is the one thing you should force down because it doesn't really taste that good. But if you're not having a good time and you're preparing all this food, it's probably not the food you should be eating. So with that, we're going to convert over to here for like the last 10 minutes or so. Hopefully it doesn't say two minutes. OK, we're good. So we'll do this little thing here and then take some questions if you have any. So I thought one of the easiest things to do is make a really easy soup because it's getting cold and soup season. This is my favorite soup season. So we're going to make a little butternut squash soup. Super simple. Don't worry about the recipe. Y'all you can just memorize it. But it starts with making a good quality broth. And so you can call it chicken stock. You can call it bone broth. I learned, I learned it as chicken stock. And so it starts with good quality bones. This one is a chicken stock. If you have availability for uh, beef bones, whatever you could find, obviously you want to find organic sources or pasture-raised animals. Again, it's a big package of beef bones. It's going to cost you a couple bucks, and you get a lot of food out of that. So um, super important. When you buy a whole chicken, that's why I always advocate buying whole chickens as opposed to just the breast or just the thighs. Um, and when you really start shopping at the farmer's markets, you find it's really hard to 
to buy just individual pieces. So um, the days of me going to the farmer's market and getting like 100 chicken wings for my Super Bowl party is sort of over. But if you buy a whole chicken, you get to roast it, or you could break it down into eight different parts, and you get the breasts for one meal, the thighs for another meal, the wings could be a treat, and then you have this amazing, and you get all the, the offals, and then you could um, obviously use the bones to make stock. So one chicken carcass will make about a gallon of stock, and so I add that in there. I cover it with the best quality water you can, and then we'll add in um, a little bit of unpasteurized apple cider vinegar. So whenever we're making bone broths or chicken stocks, you want to add a little bit of vinegar and let that sit for just a little while. And so those acids in the vinegar will start to help break down those bones so that more of that collagen and gelatin or that collagen can come out and all that nutrition. And um, that's like the key part. And then what we want to add in is obviously some vegetables that are going to add um, different uh, flavors. I'm not one to usually go to the store and go buy my onions and buy my carrots and buy my celery to add it to a stock that's going to get cooked to mush. Um, usually I have onions on hand, but what I like to do is keep a little uh, produce bag handy. And so whenever you're doing vegetable prep at home, you can make your own stock freezer bag. So when the time comes to make a stock, you have all the scraps you need. So trimming up some tomatoes, add those scraps into the bag. The celery pieces that you might not use, you could throw them in there. Little bits of um, obviously your onion peels and the ends of the onions that you might not dice up and add to your recipe, you could put those in there. Pretty much like any vegetable you could use except for, I stay away from the brassica family because they tend to add uh, bitter qualities to the stock that you don't really want. And so we have those veggies. Next I like to add different types of herbs. And so we'll do the culinary herbs like thyme, uh, rosemary, sage, Parsley stems is a big one for me, so the parsley is great, which gets used in the recipes, but those stems have really nice flavor as well. We could also add uh, different uh, uh, medicinal herbs as well. So I could put in um, something I could harvest from my place would be nettle or horsetail. I could list about a 1,000 or so, but we'll keep it at that. And then I like to add in my uh, medicinal mushrooms. So I harvest, um, might put in a couple slices of reishi or a tablespoon or two of, of ground chaga or turkey tail. I recently bought some um, lion's mane from a, a, a company in Maine, and so that went in there. And then I like to add seaweeds as well. And so kelp, kombu, I think for this one I used wild nori. Um, and so a little strip or two, that's going to add minerals. It's going to add flavor, and so that all goes into the pot. You set it up on high, let it cook, you know, minimum like four hours, but really let it go for 12 hours. Some people are like, oh, I do like a 36-hour uh, bone broth, but let it go for a good 8 to 12 hours, especially if you have one of these. The longer, the better. And by the end of it, those chicken bones should just probably just be able to like break down. Um, and then... Uh, once you have this ready to go, you could strain it off. You, once it's fully cooled, you could freeze them in little uh, containers, or you could put them into your ice tray. So if you just need a little bit, you could just pop one out of the ice tray, and that is totally good to go. And it'll keep in the fridge for probably four or five days. And uh, super cold day, a cup of that with a little spoonful of miso is like the best thing. And so that is our building block. And so we're going to add about a quart, about four cups. Actually, we'll do two because it's going to take a while. The next thing is eating or is adding in some sort of winter squash, which I love, especially right now. Um, winter squash is everywhere, and it's like, What's in season? They're great because you could buy a lot of them and they last at room temperature for months on end. So um, I actually had my next door neighbor came over and uh, he has a little, he has a land on this side and has a little five acre farm on the other side. And he, he grew up on my street. He's 67 and um, 
very interesting guy, but he's like, you like squash? And he came over with his tractor, and the whole bucket was full of squash, and he gave me about two dozen butternuts, and I, he, not, it was delicata, but he, I forgot the name he called them, but um, gave me a whole big mess of them, and so that was like a really nice gift. I gave him some fish fillets, and it was a great trade. And so I've always had this habit of sometimes, especially if you ever cooked a blue Hubbard, they're like 12 pounds sometimes, and by the time you get to the end of it, you're like, I don't want to eat this. So cooking it all at once, and then you could freeze it or whatever, but doing this soup is a great way to add in a lot of squashes. And for me, I think each season comes with um, a food that is meant for your body. So a big one is in the spring. I don't know how much snow you guys get around here, but where I am, even in March, we could have three or four feet of snow on the ground, but once those foods start growing um, and you get all those shoots and those roots and the asparagus starts coming up and some different wild foods, I think those are the foods that are, um, our body mostly craves because we've eaten these starches all winter long, sort of this like really heavy warming diet. And then suddenly like 50 degrees comes, you're outside in your t-shirt and shorts and like running around. And um, it's sort of a naturally cleansing diet. I'm not one that wants to do cleanses every every month of the year, but there are certain times of the year that I definitely want to sort of like release and uh, start sort of thinning out in a way um, after a long winter. So, but these foods I really love, and so I roast these whole, I cut them in half, take out the seeds, put a little bit of fat on the, uh, on the tray, throw them in a 350 degree oven, and just let them cook until they're nice and tender. And of course, you could add any squash you want. You could add uh, roasted carrots. I love doing whole roasted carrots. One, because you don't have to cut them or do any prep. But, uh, and they're super fun when you're plating them for different dinner parties that I do. But they also bring out the sweet sweetness. And when they char a little bit, they add that nice little bitter quality. And so really, anything goes here. One little bit more. Okay, so we'll add that. Next, we're going to add a little bit of miso. So this is how we're adding in that fermented food. And miso, um, generally, traditionally made from soy, but now you can get a lot of different soy-free misos. So it's made from chickpea. I make, so I make um, miso at home using different beans that are grown locally. So you could do a black bean miso and... Um, Really salty, the one thing you gotta watch out is if you have too much miso soup, it's gonna be dehydrating. So you gotta make sure you add a little bit of, make sure you're drinking plenty of water so you don't dehydrate yourself. But generally, maybe one tablespoon per eight ounces of liquid is a good ratio. Okay, and then we gotta add some good quality butter. And so this is a cool company called Vital Farms. They sell eggs. And I just saw this for the first time, so I picked it up. Pasture-raised um, butter. I always do unsalted. I never buy salted butter, just out of preference. But if I am going to salt the butter, I like to add my own salt. So making sure that I'm adding sea salt or Himalayan salt or a good quality salt as opposed to um, uh, maybe an iodized salt. I forgot my knife, so I'll use my pocket knife. And we'll just add about two tablespoons or six get that in there. If you want to spice it up, you could add a little bit of hot sauce. Just change out the blender here. And then blend it up. If you notice that I like it a little bit more on the thin side, but you could obviously make it really thick if you want. Um, if you had the chicken, you could maybe shred that earlier, and then you could add some more chunks. So I might cook some veggies off to the side if you don't want like a thin soup. But um, I'll put this in my Stanley thermos and take this with me if I'm on the road or if I'm going to be out working outside. But um, that was a super simple soup that has 
made from all four kingdoms and uh, super nourishing. It sort of gives you that idea of time and place for me. So it's sort of all encompassing of the, the life that I, lifestyle that I like to live. So let me get a taste. Not too shabby. All right. Any questions? Before we end, we're going to be taking a lunch break in about four minutes. Um, if you want to come say hi before you go take lunch, I'll come over here and I'll give you some samples if you want. But any questions that come up? We're going to, one second. Can you say that again, please? Uh, okay. Can you tell us the name of the herb that was in your yard that you found that yeah. it was a patch? Can you spell it? It's called self S-E-L-F? Heal. Yep, S-E. It's self-heal. Yeah, like, literally. Oh. Yeah, there's another name, but self-heal is all you need to know, okay. and you can look it up. Okay. And then actually, I don't think I've ever seen a product in a store or on the market for that. So it's something you might be able to buy the dried herb, or you can connect with me, and I'll ship you some next summer. But yeah, self-heal. We're going to wait till the mic goes around. OK, um, how much vinegar did you add to your broth? And was it apple cider did you use? Yes, I primarily use apple cider vinegar, unpasteurized. You could find like Bragg's apple cider vinegar, and generally about two tablespoons. It's just a, a good splash. Okay. Thank you. I'll answer wherever Robin goes. So, What's the type of knife that you used in the brand this that you showed that the showed? picture? Yeah. This is a company called Bloodroot Blades. Blood root blades. That specific style is called the nakiri, which is a Japanese vegetable cutting knife. Um, this one, it comes from a company uh, that does custom knives. And I actually had to wait 21 months to get that knife. So maybe not your go-to knife brand. But the steel was, came from a um, saw blade. And then the handle was pecan wood that they cut down on their property. And so if anyone's on Instagram, there are so many custom knife companies out there. And so um, it's amazing. The only problem with buying a knife like that is um, you want to make sure, like I always encourage people if you're going to go buy a knife to go to a cutlery store so you actually pick up a knife and get a good feeling for it. So you might have small hands in a 10-inch knife is too big for you. Or you have big hands, and that particular knife might just be too small. And so it's always good to get a feel for the knife. But um, yeah, that one is like a really special knife for me. But um, Wustoff, uh, I really love Global Knives, which is all st Japanese steel. You can get a good quality uh, chef knife for like 90 bucks. But if you're willing to spend $100 to 125 bucks on a knife, and you keep it sharp, it'll last you for a really long time. Hi. OK, that's it. OK, one more, sorry. Yeah, is uh, lemon juice interchangeable with the apple cider vinegar if you'd prefer that flavor for the broth? I would say you could probably get away with using lemon juice. You could pro distilled white vinegar would probably be fine as well. I'd stay away from more of a, the, I don't think the lemon's going to, by the time this is done cooking, I don't think it's going to taste like lemon soup. But um, I would stay away from like balsamic or red wine vinegar or champagne kind of thing. All right, folks, that's it. If you have more questions, my booth is just that way. We're going to take a lunch break. Can we please give a big hand for Robin and the whole no, crew? No, for Frank, for Frank. <laughs>